As temperatures across Europe plummet, thousands of migrants are still stranded in Belarus. Many have spent weeks outside in freezing forests near Poland. They're still hoping to find a route into the European Union, though Brussels insists the bloc will not accept them. DW's Nick Connolly met some of those migrants in the Belarusian capital Minsk. He spoke to people torn between hope and resignation. This is definitely not where these migrants imagined their journey to the EU would end, in downtown Minsk. But with successful border crossings to Poland and Lithuania down to a trickle, migrants stuck here in the Belarusian capital now face a stark choice. Risk their lives in sub-zero temperatures in the forests of the border region or return to their home countries empty-handed after paying smugglers thousands of euros. Like the vast majority of migrants here, Suleiman is from Iraq's Kurdish region. He spent weeks in the border forest, even managing to cross to Poland twice, one time for several days. He came within a hair's breadth of success. We were a matter of meters from the car that was supposed to take us to Germany, five minutes or so, when the Polish police caught us. They beat us and destroyed our mobile phones. They broke my friend's hand and let their dogs loose on us. It was really scary. I want to go back to the border. I can't afford to pay for my hostel anymore. I'm going to try again today. Suleiman, like many others, is sleeping out on the streets. For people like him, with expired visas, even the most cramped hostels charge upwards of 20 euros to sleep on the floor. Nirosh and her mother left Iraq with their entire family in the hope of finding medical treatment for Nirosh's brother. After 10 days in the forest, they gave up and returned to Minsk. Their male relatives are still in the forest. At least that's the last they heard. We lost touch with my brothers about 10 days ago. Maybe their phones are just out of battery, but they could be dead by now. They have no clue where we are, whether we're still here or returned to Iraq. The people smugglers told us it would only take two or three hours to cross the border towards Germany. We had no idea what it would be like. We borrowed money from everyone to come here, to get treatment for our family. Now that money is gone and we haven't made it. But a return to Iraq is not something many here are ready to countenance yet. Some say they're already considering applying for asylum here in Belarus. Anything but a return to Iraq. Definitely not a scenario the Belarusian regime envisaged when it opened its borders to thousands of Europe-bound migrants this summer. Well, meanwhile, the exiled Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Tikhanovskaya has told the European Union it must live up to its values and actively oppose the authoritarian leader Alexander Lukashenko. DW's Barbara Wiesel caught up with her in Brussels. Ms Tikhanovskaya, Belarus is in the headlines these days, everywhere, uh, but all the focus is on the border crisis with Poland that was initiated by Alexander Lukashenko. Do you feel that in this whole context, you, the democratic opposition, are forgotten by the European Union? I'm sure we, we are not forgotten. I understand that focus was shifted, but it's anyway about Belarus. And our task to uh, open uh, the eyes of the people, who is the reason of this border crisis, who is guilty, uh, you know, how, how to solve this crisis uh, in, in these circumstances. You can't solve this crisis without dismantling the regime, because uh, time after time, a uh, dictator will use other methods of uh, blackmailing the European Union. So what do you fear? What could he do? What else could he do? I mean, this was already fairly inventive. Everybody was shocked. So what else could he have up his sleeve? Since the beginning, we told that only uh, on the one hand pressure on the regime, political isolation, economic isolation, uh, and uh, support of civil society, positive agenda for future Belarus, uh, communication about uh, free visas for Belarusians. Uh, you know, this comprehensive plan was very well accepted by Belarusians. You know, all this consistent and united position of uh, democratic countries will help Belarusians to, to win. So j just keep consistency, stay united and uh, 
uh, produce joint, uh, joint decision. But you do more, want more from the EU. Uh, for instance, uh, let's look at sanctions. You mentioned mm -hmm. the economic side. Uh, they were so far fairly timid. They haven't really hurt Lukashenko. So are you pleading for hard sanctions, really cutting off finance and, and cutting off access to the finance market or just to block exports? What would you want? You know, I'm sure that people who are dealing with sanctions know uh, what uh, and who should be sanctioned in Belarus. Uh, but this policy, again, should be joined and, and strong. I believe me, uh, everybody knows how to deal with the dictatorship. So how hopeful are you? Uh, it is uh, more, more than a year that uh, the big demonstrations took place in Minsk. Uh, uh, it seems uh, attention from the outside has died down. The, the, the geopolitical caravan seems to have moved on in some instances. So you think you can sort of garner interest again, get the focus back on you? You know, I'm sure that Belarus will be a success story of uh, peaceful transition of power because I know people in Belarus. I know thousands of uh, people who, despite of this terror, despite of uh, repressions, continue step by step move forward. Uh, I believe Belarus will be a success story because uh, I see how many allies we have in the world. Strong countries understand why we are doing this, we share the same values, and you are ready to uh, fight for these values together with us. And uh, I know that Belarus will be a success story because uh, uh, I know myself. I have no choice. I can't stop, so as millions of Belarusians can't stop. So uh, be with us. Uh, be the part of this success story. Ms. Tikhanovskaya, thank you very much. Thank you. The deaths of 27 people in the English Channel are deepening tensions between Britain and France. The French Interior Minister has cancelled weekend talks with his UK counterpart after suggestions by the British Prime Minister that France wasn't doing enough to stop migrants trying to reach England by boat. DW correspondent Jack Parrick visited the French port of Calais and spoke to people there hoping to cross the Channel. Chalau left Kirkuk in Iraq six weeks ago. Having travelled through Turkey, Greece, Serbia and Austria, he's paid thousands of euros to get here to France. He hopes he'll soon make it to the UK. I have problems in Iraq. I have no idea where my close family are. The only people I have left are relatives in Britain, so I'm going there. He's one of hundreds of men, women and children stuck in makeshift camps dotted up and down the coast, which are regularly destroyed by French police. For many of them, us asking about it was the first time they'd heard about the 27 people who drowned in the sea after their boat capsized this week. People are charged €5,000 by smugglers if they successfully cross this 31 kilometer strait to Britain. On top of these waters being dirty and treacherous, this is also the busiest shipping channel in the world. But until now, that hasn't prevented people from boarding flimsy boats and trying to make their way to the UK. Over 25,000 people have survived the crossing this year, according to UK authorities. At a nearby centre, which coordinates aid support for the refugees, they say EU rules which stipulate a person must apply for asylum in the first country they enter are contributing to the situation. They have their fingerprints in another country in Europe, so they can't uh, ask, apply for asylum in France. So this is the, <clears throat> their last chance is uh, trying to ask for asylum in English. This part of the coast has been the front line of the battle between the UK and France on this issue since the Calais jungle camp sprung up in 2015. The deaths at sea have returned the focus, but the crisis has never really been put out.